Hi, everybody. Welcome to our workshop on the Wharton interview, the Wharton TBD and one-on-one -on -one session. Um, I am delighted that you are here because if you are here, that likely means you were invited to interview with Wharton. So congratulations. That's a great spot to be. Some of you actually might be uh, attending this thinking a year or two out. There's always a good place to be. Okay, I'm getting some odd feedback. Not sure if that's just me. I don't hear anything. Feedback, sound feedback? Well, I do, yes. Okay, it sounds good now. I think there was just a little bit of a hiccup there. My apologies, everybody. Now it sounds to be fine. I was hearing myself talk, which is not as fun. Um, but let me take a little bit of um, a moment to introduce myself. Um, my name is Liza Wheel, and I am the founder of Gatehouse. Um, actually, Rachel, I'm going to ask you to take the lead on doing this for a second while I double check my audio. My apologies, guys. I'm glad you guys can hear, but I'm going to give it to Rachel for a sec. Okay. So um, I'm Rachel Nelson. I'll introduce myself in a second, but um, obviously you heard Liza speaking. Uh, Liza founded Gatehouse, and um, we are a group of... MBAs from uh, Harvard, Stanford, and Wharton, and we offer really high-touch service for clients uh, across a variety of schools, but really our bread and butter is Harvard, Stanford, and Wharton. And um, as you can see on the slide, over 90% of our clients are accepted into at least one of those programs if they apply. So we've had great success with those schools. Um, and I can introduce myself. Uh, I am Rachel Nelson. And um, okay, uh, so okay, shall I go ahead and introduce myself? Or do... great. Uh, so I'm Rachel Nelson. As you can see, I'm a Wharton MBA, so I'm intimately familiar with um, the position that a lot of you are sitting in. I went to Harvard for college, uh, and originally. I was an alumni interview. Well, actually, I still am an alumni interviewer for Harvard, but I was an alumni interviewer for Wharton. And that is what uh, sort of stimulated one of my real interests in helping people uh, apply to business school. So I've been doing it for almost 10 years. And um, alongside, you know, a lot of my colleagues here, I, uh, we each have sort of areas of expertise. For me, obviously, it's Wharton. We work with clients Across a variety of schools, but um, Wharton is very near and dear to my heart. And I would say team-based discussions in particular are something that I've done a lot of uh, and really enjoy doing. So um, I know that Liza is having some issues with sound. Um, and I may just keep going until they get resolved. Um, So uh, to kind of summarize the structure of the Wharton interview, there's two parts. The first is the team-based discussion, uh, and the second piece is the one-on-one. -on -one. And so um, we will go through both of those parts and kind of talk through how they work together, how they give Wharton a good perspective of you. And I do believe that Liza's solved your technical issue, so I may turn it back to you to see if you have anything to add in here. I'm back, you guys. Sorry. I, you know, it's one of those things you be, you do this umpteen times and then um, the umpteenth plus one time something goes awry. Everything is back in action now. Thank you so much, Rachel, for kicking this off. Um, and yes, um, as we were just saying, there's two components. We're actually going to spend the majority of the conversation on this front half, the TBD, the team-based discussion, because that is where when you're interviewing with Wharton, you are going to be spending the majority of your time as well. And then we'll briefly touch on the one-on-one -on -one interview. It's something that um, is, I think, a, a, an excellent component of Wharton's um, interview structure. The TBD, which we'll talk about in a second, is unique to, to Wharton. And, uh, you know, understandably, that gives a lot of angst for, um, for, for folks that really are worried, like, gosh, I'm a good interviewer. Why do I have to do this non-normal uh, interview? The one, one interview will give you a chance to sort of be in that more normal or more at least more standard um, interview situation, which is great. So with that, let's dive into the, the prompt itself. So 
I'm not going to read this entire thing to you, but you all, for all of you who are, who have been interviewed or invited to interview, you all received this prompt. So hopefully it's not the first time that you actually saw this, um, that you're seeing this prompt. But basically with the team-based discussion, Wharton presents to you, you know, we, we call it a prompt, a challenge, uh, something that they want um, your input on. I actually think it's a great way for Wharton to get some, um, you know, ideas from creative thinkers. So they put the, this challenge or this prompt out to all the applicants to discuss in their Wharton team-based discussion. But the gist of this is basically that they are interested in your ideas for a new course for the pre back program. This is for, you know, leading or um, you, uh, top high school senior juniors and seniors that might enroll in this program. And they want to hear ideas from you. So that will be one the the first part really of this challenge. And then what you can see on the next slide is what you'll actually have to deliver as part of your group, your team, you'll have to come up with a name of this new course that you're designing, an overview of the course topics and themes. Um, you also will be asked to identify a faculty member who will partner um, with you for the course, um, two learning outcomes, so skills or knowledge that you really want the participants in the program to learn, and then um, an assessment method. Basically, how will you assess whether or not that this course did, um, for the students enrolled, did in achieve the outcomes that you expected it to? So I wanna pause here and um, Rachel, I'm curious. Okay, so we definitely like, um, we, we get very into the prompts, just like we get into the essay questions that the schools announce. We certainly take, in, we're always waiting for the prompt to be released. So I'm curious, Rachel, any reactions to you on uh, Wharton's prompt from this year? Yeah, well, so I think the first thing is the most obvious, which is that it's changed. I think for a number of years, Wharton used the same prompt, um, which was around these field programs that um, MBA students participated in. And this year, they've actually changed it up. So whether it was because um, they were getting stale content or just, you know, uh, wanted a breath of fresh air or something like that, I don't know. But um, this question is new and it's interesting. And so it's something I suspect that a lot of Wharton applicants aren't even aware of the pre back program. So I think... Um, it's a really good opportunity and to do some research on Wharton. And I suspect that's also what they're looking for people to do is really dig in um, and understand more about what Wharton offers. Um, obviously, many of you will probably put that into your essays already, but really digging down to the level of thinking about professors, what they offer, what kind of um, topics they might teach to high school students is uh, a kind of a new and different angle. Yeah, I think that's great. I think it will um, encourage people to both, you get the creativity and actually thinking about the idea of what course you might want to teach, but then doing that extra research on Wharton too will give you a chance to get to know Wharton even better throughout your research and also demonstrate that knowledge to the observers as well. So that leads um, to the next slide, which really talks about the logistics of what you can expect. And some of this, you this again, should be pretty familiar with um, to those of you who have been invited to interview, but there'll be five to six other Wharton, excuse me, uh, four to five other Wharton um, candidates. So five to six total in each Zoom group. Um, and when you are there, the way the, the session will start is you will be expected to introduce yourself briefly to the other folks in your TBD and to present your idea, your own personal idea for the uh, solution. You'll have a minute to present your idea. And then once each of you has gone through introducing yourself and sharing your ideas, then you will uh, work sort of uh, on your own as a group um, for about 25 minutes to come up with a group solution, one that you guys can agree on and further flesh out. And then you'll have five minutes at the end to present your idea to two observers that will be in the Zoom room with you. Typically, these um, observers are second year Wharton students, but they could also be members of the admissions team as well. Um, but the headline is, through all of this, you will be observed um, from start to finish, not only in the presentation, but also in your additional initial introduction and as you are working as a team 
towards that final uh, uh, presentation deliverable as well. So um, is the project a real one? Mean uh, it will be implemented or is it a fictional project? You know, that's a that's a great question. I think really Wharton has you know tweaked this in the 10 or so years that they've been doing this. They focused on different things. I remember one year, maybe five years ago, it was something about gaming, how um, back when AI still felt years and years away, they brought up the idea of gaming and how that might be used within a course. So, you know, whether or not this will actually ever be implemented, who knows? It's probably a few years out. But are they actually doing some sort of uh, research and creative brainstorming via the ideas that come forth and that are generated in the, these TBDs? Absolutely. They'll get creative ideas whether or not it will actually move forward. That's all going to depend on the school and where they want to invest their time and resources. But for the, all intents and purposes for you um, in your TBD, this is a, a fictional situation. The stakes aren't that they're going to then go implement this and test it. But you never know, they might um, borrow your ideas and implement them down the road, for sure. Yeah, um, I would add to that quickly. So I think you're exactly right. It, um, it probably won't be implemented, but when you're, when you're going through, you want it to be um, realistic. So, uh, you know, a class that, I don't know, involves a trip to Mars or, you know, something that would require um, something that's probably not that feasible in today's structure. Um, probably tips a little bit into too much into the, to the fictional. So I would just say um, it's great to be creative. It doesn't have to be so in the moment that it's stale, but um, you do want it to be actionable and something that could actually be executable. Great. Good. So here's how, um, here's how I, so these are all good questions actually. And just to tee up the rest of the presentation as well, but I want to answer this question. Um, and I appreciate you guys answer asking questions as we go along, what we'll, we'll, how we'll handle questions. If it's a question on topic, as these are, we'll throw them up on the screen so that everybody can see what you guys are asking, what are on people's minds. And then it, it um, there are other questions that are really less pertinent to what's on the screen. We'll uh, tackle those at the end of our session. And then just to headline how we've organized the rest of this is like, really, you'll see a lot of questions. We gathered questions that we frequently get on the Wharton TBD. And we've just sort of, um, you know, both Rachel and I will chime in on things that we've seen. We've both moderated dozens and dozens and dozens of these over the years. So we've seen a lot of tactics and what can work and other things that might work less well. Um, so um, keep the questions coming and you'll see more and more of those. But I do want to take one moment to uh, answer that question, which was basically, do you need to limit yourself to Wharton resources? And can you include entire UPenn resources in your design? You can be, just to reiterate, this is um, something Rachel just said, is be creative. You can be creative. If you have something that goes beyond Wharton, feel free to mention it. You do want to think about Wharton. Um, you know, Wharton is generally the focus. So what I wouldn't do is have your entire answer be focused on something that's happening, um, you know, in the policy program or something like that. Have it focused to the, the, the core of it be related to Wharton but you could certainly think about other um, resources throughout UPenn. Rachel, would you agree with that? Yeah, absolutely. I, I would say you definitely want to um, be as creative as possible. Um, we'll talk a little bit more about this kind of when we dive into talking about how you create your pitch. Um, but yeah, I think you want, you want at the end of the day, you are applying to Wharton. So uh, it's a little bit of a balancing act. You want to have done your research on Wharton. You want to show that you um, are interested enough to have spent the time and the energy. So um, yeah, be creative, but, but you'd want to answer kind of the question of how will Wharton implement this? Great. Good. All right. Let's start with some of these questions. And I'm going to um, just, because you are an alumna of the program, Rachel, I'm going to ask you to take some of these. I'll chime in, I'm sure too. But so from your perspective, why does Wharton use this format of this TBD? It's the only school to do it. I know that just um, Ross, um, U, U Michigan Ross, uh, sort of had a similar but less institutionalized. It was not the core part of their interview process. It was a little bit of an extra added bonus, and they don't think they have been doing that for probably four or five years. It's really Wharton that started this and is kept to it. And, and I'm curious from your perspective, why does they, why does Wharton use such a unique um, format for their um, admissions interview? 
Yeah. So I think um, in order to be successful at Wharton, it's really about how well you work with others. It's about being collaborative. I think a lot of schools give lip service to that. Um, but really for Wharton, in order to succeed in the classroom, you have to be effective working with your learning team and working in groups. Um, and, and certainly first year, you won't select who those groups are for the majority of your classes. Uh, and they will seek out to put you into groups of people um, who are very different from yourself in terms of background, in terms of sort of almost every single characteristic that you can come up with. And so um, that I would say is the hallmark of Wharton. They want people who are collaborative and able to be dropped into an environment and produce a result and be successful as a leader without just kind of being able to cherry pick your group. Um, and this tests that because you're stuck in a group with six people that you've never met before and you have a very specific task and you don't have a whole lot of time. And so obviously um, it's a little bit different from real life in the sense that uh, everybody participating knows that they're being watched and is sort of on best behavior, but it's about as close to modeling the experience of showing up with a new learning team um, as Wharton can do. And so I think it's um, very much an opportunity for them to figure out whether you fit in, I would say, with the ethos of the school, but also, you know, can you actually um, get along with your classmates? I also like that because I feel like um, there is this, you know, I think Wharton, it feels like sometimes has this, this ill-formed reputation of like, you know, being somewhat more competitive. And I feel like the way you just described it is so, I feel like it was a great way to Wharton, for Wharton to kind of toss that or turn that on its head and really focus on the team, not the individual, just by the very nature of the name and the very um, approach it uses. I feel like it is, um, it just was a great way to um, really stress the value of the team, which is super and, and certainly a lot of fun for us to observe. So um, I, you, you touched on this, Rachel, slightly um, a little bit, but like, what is, what else do you think Wharton is looking for in the team-based discussion? And I know also just, I think where, where I'd ask you also to comment on is based on your experience um, pre um, TBD or outside of the TBD when you interviewed Wharton applicants, um, you know, just like what, what is Wharton trying to assess in those things? Yeah. So I think um, I'm going to go back to what you said, because actually I think it's a really useful way to think about it, which is Wharton has a reputation as a competitive school. I would say all, as also a school that produces CFOs, like very, very siloed. And I think um, it's really trying to move away from that with this idea of, um, you know, producing leaders. Uh, and so uh, it's kind of being able to be a problem solver. It's being able to be strategic. It's um, being a creative thinker. So, um, you know, that's what I would say the school is really looking for. And I think, um, you know, that's in large part um, what they're finding out from, from this uh, mock interview structure. Cool. That's great. Yeah. They can definitely see a lot of people's, um, you can't, uh, and we'll talk a little bit about this, but you, it's so in the moment, you can't really take who you are or, you know, and so um, it really plays well to those folks who can be strategic and problem solving in a group, as opposed to someone who's really looking out for themselves. Good. Great. Okay. Next question. So this one, we get a ton, right? Um, how should I prepare for my pitch? Um, because again, remember, you will have to present your pitch. Um, you'll have one minute to do so when you get in, when your TBD kicks off. So what you might be wondering now is how to prepare. Any quick tips from you, Rachel, on how folks should be preparing for their pitch? Yeah, so I'd say the first thing is um, take the time. I mean, it sounds obvious, but take the time to prepare. I think some people think they're just going to like slide in and um, it's going to go really well. And you will feel awkward if everybody else in your group has uh, prepared as they should. Um, so I would say take the time, read the prompt, um, think about, you know, we've already kind of covered this idea of like being creative and maybe pushing the boat out a little bit, but also thinking about things that you're familiar with. So, um, you know, it's a great opportunity to showcase something about yourself. Um, you know, maybe you can come up with a class that relates to an interest that you have or um, a deal you've done or, um, again, researching professors. You know, there is is there a professor who particularly resonates with you and kind of, you know, um, use it as an opportunity to 
use the knowledge that you have to come up with an idea that no one else is going to come up with. So I would start by um, really reading through the prompt. There are a number of different pieces. Your prompt is short. Sorry, your answer is short. You have about a minute. So very likely you won't be able to cover all of those pieces, but you want to have an answer for every single one of them. Um, and then I would say the key is just to practice. You don't want to sound like a robot, but you do want to practice enough that A, your pitch is clear and B, your pitch is a minute because it's very, very easy. And when we do these team-based discussions, inevitably people go over, way over um, in these mocks. And so, uh, which is great because it's an opportunity to practice and realize that you've gone way over. Um, but I would say whether you do it at home with, you know, a kind of videotaping yourself on your phone or with a partner or a friend, um, the time limits matter and you do want to, you know, understand what you can actually cover in that amount of time. And uh, I'll take this question, but I, well, actually, I'm going to chime in first on what you were just saying, uh, Rachel, and then I'll take that question. Uh, just to underscore, yes, when um, people, you know, she said it's, it sounds crazy to prepare your pitch ahead of time, but you really should and, and practice because um, we've done a number of these or a number in a number of the mocks, TBDs that we've hosted people will come in being like, oh, I didn't realize I was really supposed to have an idea or I didn't know. So again, thank goodness they did the mock with us, but still, yeah, you need to invest time because it's just this, the practice that you do, it'll just be a get you prepared for the real thing. But the more you practice it, just the more fluid you'll be with your, um, with your pitch. And then the only other thing is I would encourage you to be vivid and specific in your answer too. Um, as Rachel said, you can't, knock off everything, but remember you're trying to pitch your idea and vivid details or specifics will help it, help the people um, that are on your team see your idea better and it'll just be more likely to resonate with them. Is the one minute introduction, introduction supposed to include an introduction to you and your background? So based on the guidance that Wharton, um, I think this is in one of the elements of the um, information that they gave you when they invited um, you to interview yesterday, when those in invites came out, it said something about how you will be able to introduce yourself and then you'll have one minute. So you can introduce, introduce yourself briefly, maybe 10 seconds, and then have a minute to present your idea. Um, but you don't want a, nor do you want a minute long introduction and a minute long pitch. Um, so, Can I chime in with one yeah. quick thing? So I think um, when you think about background, it's really brief, like where you're from, what you do, your name. Um, but kind of where, what, we're, what I was saying before about background, there may be something about your background that relates to your idea that I would consider to be within the structure of your one minute pitch. So if you are... Um, you know, if there's some aspect that relates to how you've come up with that idea, as Liza said, the more specific you can be, the more vivid, the more detailed, um, you know, if you want to explain why you kind of why this resonates with you or where the idea came from, keep it brief, but that would be considered to be within that one minute. Great. All right, Rachel, you want to take this one also in the pitch? Um, so, uh, okay, we're going to cover this later. The key point being, it doesn't matter if your pitch is chosen. However, oh. you want your pitch to be great. And so I would say um, you want to drop in enough bullet points or ideas, enough ideas that somebody um, gets a sense of what you're talking about. So effectively, if your idea is not chosen, having a whole bunch of um, material that you've kept back is going to be kind of useless. So I wouldn't think about it as having a great reveal that you kind of come up with at the end. But what I would think about it is almost like... Um, and we'll cover this later, but if your idea is chosen, you will become the de facto leader or one of the leaders of the group. And you want to have some extra material that you can share at that point to keep the discussion moving. But I would say at the outset, um, yeah, make sure that your idea is clear and as specific as possible. One minute is very, very short. So my personal opinion is it's almost no chance that you're going to give away too much information. Um, but I just think there's no point in saving it for later because very likely saving it for later means there will be no uh, later. Somebody else's idea is going to be picked. Should the class that you pitch be radically different from the existing, um, uh, the Wharton Young GP existing curriculum? Okay. So I'll chime in on this one. Um, so here's to go back to where we started. 
the purpose of this is to see how well you work with the team to be creative, to be thoughtful, to problem solve, to come up with a great idea. Um, chances that the idea is actually implemented are probably approaching zero. So I, my thought is don't get so caught up in your pitch being the be all end all. You're not going to get into Wharton because your pitch was chosen or because your pitch is amazing. You're going to get in because you worked really well with your teammates. And so um, I don't know. It could be radically different or it might not be radically different. It doesn't really matter, but I would say that's kind of not the point. I would come up with an idea that interests you that when you talk about it, again, you can be specific about it. You have some knowledge of it, whether you've already worked on it or you kind of do the research, um, but that you, you're passionate, that you show this kind of affinity for it. Um, but I don't think it really matters. It may be that your idea is something that no one's ever thought of, um, but it may be that it actually is relatively similar and that's okay too. I mean, what I would say is keep in mind, these are high school students. So again, you're probably not going to be shipping them off to Mars to go, you know, I don't know, figure out the composition of this or that. So, you know, you want to be realistic. So how important is there or any evaluative element to how unique or creative the pitch actually is. AK, would you be dinged if you pitch something um, totally banal like intro to um, finance? Um, I mean, there, there's no, there's not necessarily a rubric in this. Um, it, it's just reiterating kind of what everything that Rachel just said. If it's something you're passionate about. So if it's intro to finance, what's going to make it special? Why, why would, so the other, the other thing to always think about is you're pitching this idea to this team of five, four or five other people around you. Um, and your pitch is for a course for high school senior, juniors and seniors, and you are super excited about it. And you are, you're convinced, you know, or you're um, optimistic that high school juniors and seniors will be excited about it as well. If you've got an angle on intro to finance that would revolutionize the way it's taught or even just make it so much more approachable, um, go for it. If it's like literally, I want to take this course that is already offered, and that is my idea. That's not gonna. That's not the right way to do it. So you're not being tested on all of these elements are important. Are you creative? Are you creative problem solver? And there's all the other components on the how you actually work through the team. They're all part of this. But the biggest headline is come up with an idea that you're excited about and that you could pitch to your team and think that, yeah, this is also something that would be both interesting and useful to up and coming high school juniors and seniors. So Liza, you said something on one of the um, mock TVDs that we did, I think it was like last year, maybe the year before. Um, and you said, think about who you're marketing this to. And I thought that's like actually just a really good way to think about it, which is, um, yeah, so you're pitching to your group. Ultimately, you know, you're pitching to the admissions committee. But the idea is somebody needs to take your class, right? In order for it to be um, something that Wharton would actually want to offer, it has to resonate with a high school senior, high school junior, or whatever it is. So um, it's almost like you want to think about who is your customer at the end, you know. Wharton's a business school. It's a marketing school. Um, so who are you marketing this to? Who is your customer? How are you going to structure it in that way? Um, so for example, intro to finance, Wharton is a big, big, big finance school. And there are some big heavy hitter names. So um, those may already be, you know, they may have already pulled in some of their big names to do classes, but there may be an angle, or maybe it's a class with two of them talking about differing viewpoints. So those types of things are ways that you can take um, something really basic and make it a little bit more interesting that again would entice somebody participating in the program to actually want to sign up. And, and likewise, if it's so creative, but it has actually nothing to do with business. Um, yeah, you've proven that you can think creatively, but it's actually not at all practical and not what they're looking for either. So again, like, it, you know, um, there's always, it depends in these answers. Um, there's there's not really a way like, oh, I've got to over index on this or that, but just it's really about thinking about what it is that you're interested in, on, in, in and then thinking about what that course would be too. Great. All right, let's keep going. So how do I prepare for the team's discussion? So we're moving off, at least for now, we'll come back to the pitch, but we're going to talk a little bit um, on how you prepare for the team discussion. I know I have my thoughts on this, but um, I, actually I'll start, I'll start with some thoughts on this. Um, the big thing about preparing for the team discussion is 
Well, it's a few things. Um, one, you ultimately want to be yourself. Um, you know, it, it, it's the bit just best way to sort of go in and be natural and be yourself, how you work with um, others in a team. That's what you want to do. So just be cognizant of that. Now, what does that mean actually in um, terms of preparation? That's a little bit harder because I think the biggest thing with the TBD and Rachel chime in on this is like, it's just like this unknown thing. And you're like, not really sure what to expect and like how to be. So I think one, you know, certainly one of the reasons that we do our TBDs um, and enjoy them as much as we do is it just gives people a chance to feel what this is going to feel like and almost get through that, like, okay, the angst of like, I don't know what this is going to be and just be themselves. Um, so I think that's one way to prepare. And then we'll, we'll also have some strategic tips on like kind of back pocket tools that you can use when you are in your TBD. But I think overall it's, it's recognizing you don't have to be one way or another, but just to be yourself. But then I would just also say an elevated, awareness about the roles that you play on teams and the roles that you can play on teams. And to, and and you might want to play some of those roles strategically um, in the TBD. So I'll, I'll pause there because I'm sure, Rachel, you sort of know what I'm alluding to there. And just if you have any additional tips on how people should prepare for it. Yeah, so I would completely agree. I mean, I guess the short answer is I'm not sure how much there is to prepare in the sense that um, we are all who we are. And so, um, you know, you're going to kind of, um, it, it's really about how, how you interact with other people. So what I would say is it's not really preparation so much as maybe thinking about how you interact in a team, uh, meaning, do you tend to be a leader? Do you tend to be very outspoken and talk a lot? That's me. So I would probably go into the team-based discussion, trying to be um, maybe a little bit softer, maybe trying to be, to listen more rather than talk. There will be other people who tend to be more quiet. So maybe they sit and they wait until the end of the meeting and then they have something really profound to say. Those people may want to kind of actually step forward a little bit more than they're comfortable with. So to Liza's point, you don't want to be somebody that you're not. But at the end of the day, if you don't say anything in the team-based discussion, there's nothing to evaluate you on. So it's more like thinking about how you interact with people. Um, you know, how do you show leadership? But, but really... Um, and we'll kind of talk about this later, but everybody in your in your team based discussion can get in. So you're not this is not your competition by any stretch. And so you really want to figure out how do you make everybody else in your group look great? Um, and by doing that, you will look great. And so um, it's not so much preparation it's just maybe being self aware and thoughtful about the tools and techniques that you can use to, um, you know, to put your best foot forward and to help everybody else put their best foot forward as well. Ah, what's the best way to pick an idea from the group? Would a voting method work or is there another structure that works better? Yes, the a voting a voting method could work. There are lots of ways um, that, you know, that can work for this. Um, I'm curious, I mean, certainly we've seen groups, I think what we can say is, you know, we've seen groups do voting, we've seen groups do a little bit more informal polling, we've seen groups that, you know, someone will take the lead on sort of bucketing the different options. There's no right or wrong way to do it. But I think what this is, what this is teeing up is that if you, you know, may perhaps something that you will add to the group is let's vote on these ideas and that you could keep in your back pocket as a, a tool to use to help your team move forward, such as proposing a vote or proposing some other way to arrange, to come up with an idea. The, again, the, um, the admissions, the observers are not trying to say, okay, well, they use this way to come up with their answer. That's right. Or that's wrong. There's no one way to do this. Um, so, it's not like you have to use a voting process, but that can certainly be something, a tool that you suggest to the rest of your team in order to come up with a, um, a solution to move forward with. So just to chime in, I would, I would always be looking for ways to move the discussion forward. So I'm going to kind of beat a dead horse, but the 25 or 30 minutes is not very long. And so um, your group will need to be marching forward to align on an idea, you know, basically to hear everybody, to align on an idea, to figure out what the structure of that idea is going to be, then to pitch it. So, um, you know, 
you don't want to be rigid. So you don't want to have this idea that it must be a voting structure or it must be some other way. But you may want to have, as Liza said, a couple of ideas in your back pocket that you then can throw out to be the person that moves the discussion forward. Um, and so I would just say that's one example, but there are many others, whether it's being a timekeeper or, um, and, and often the timekeeper role is one that's shared by lots of people. But, you know, just anything that you can do to help the collaborative process move forward um, is, is the way to go. But I would say you don't want to become too focused on it being any one way, because it may be that the group automatically decides to kind of follow some other structure, which you're happy with, and you just let it go. And that's fine, right? You, you want to make sure that you don't become the roadblock. Um, you know, you're the one person insisting that there be a formal vote when everybody else has already come to consensus that it's going to be one specific idea. That's good. Great. All right. We have another question. I know this is teed up later, but let's just take it now. If my idea is selected, how much additional detail should I be prepared to provide about it? Should I prepare to talk about lectures, topic, uh, lecture topics, projects, assessments? This is where it's a little bit of like, I'll say the Goldilocks um, idea. Like it, you, you're constantly trying to balance the, on, on this line of, um, especially if you're, if your topic is chosen of having the answers if you need them, but making sure the real answer, the real solution is a team effort. And your, if your idea, it's actually kind of like a double-edged sword, I, I think, if your idea is selected. People often are like, oh my gosh, my idea wasn't selected. It didn't, that's terrible. Um, that's not the case uh, at all. That's not your goal. The goal going in is not to have your idea selected. The goal going in is to work as a team to come up with an idea that you all feel great about or can get behind and present it to the observers. So just that's, uh, that's, a, that's a big headline. And if your idea is selected, um, it does put added responsibility on, on you because you probably, so you should have thought, at least have some instincts of the, the, you know, you gave the one minute version, maybe you've thought through what the three or four minute version of description of your course would look like, and you have that in the back of your minds. Um, but you don't want to really force everybody onto the full scope of your idea. You want to make sure you're open to others making the, the kernel, your pitch, the kernel of your idea, an even better one. So ideally, you're letting them add to it, shape it, um, develop it. But you've also got those um, those other elements and details in the back of your mind, so that if you need to, you can serve them up. Um, you know, it's 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 it is a balance because people might default to you looking for your input of like, well, did you think about a professor or how were you thinking about the assessment or what did you think about the rubric at the end of the course? And you can have answers to all of those, but remember, it's not just your idea. So even if you do you know, maybe give out a little bit of it and say, but I really would be curious on how you guys can, and you know, how we can together make this, what I was thinking even stronger, or, you know, not even giving your answer or what your ideas were right away, but letting the group chime in because you're likely going to get to a much more robust out, um, deliverable and certainly a deliverable that's going to be shared by all of you. Rachel, anything to add to that? Yeah, no, I completely agree. I think it's a balancing act. But the one thing I would suggest is um, the more that you can not necessarily be driving the conversation, but rather like drop in really insightful nuggets, the better off it will be for your group. So that's almost how I'd be thinking about it is let the conversation play out. And you're kind of like the, the guide making, you know, kind of maybe pushing them back onto the rails if they go off a little bit. Um, but just expect that there will be things that you probably know and you can kind of make a suggestion and it will, you know, for, um, I don't know, some aspect of the class that nobody's thought of and it will be, um, you know, something that really is meaningful. So I, I think just make sure back to how we talked about how to prepare and not wanting to be, you, you don't want to be um, dominating the conversation more than, um, more than you can help. So Rachel, is the goal to prove that I can play nice? I, I would say so. I mean, at, at the end of the day, so it's funny because we um, had a group last year that uh, I would say overplayed played too nice. And they, it was a real group think uh, situation. And in the end, everybody was so nice to everybody. And they, they, it was consensus. And um, they just really struggled to come up with a cohesive idea because everybody was agreeing with everybody. So I would say, broadly speaking, yes, you want to be collaborative. You want to be a team player. You want to be a leader. 
but you can be all of those things and drive results. And so, um, you know, yes, you want to walk away from this with, you know, you want everybody who sat in on your group to like you for sure. You don't want anybody to be thinking, God, that guy or that woman was kind of a nightmare. Um, but you know, it's fine. We've kind of talked about this, but it's fine to say, you know, to ask a question of somebody's idea or to not to poke holes in it, but to say, to play devil's advocate or to say, okay, that's a great idea, but have you thought about X? It's just um, all those things make the conversation better. It will make your end product better. And as long as you're respectful of your teammates, um, that's exactly what Wharton is looking for, right? That's exactly what will be expected of you in your learning team or in your project team is you know, you guys, you don't want to just be in lockstep step agreeing on everything because you're going to end up with a lousy end result. So I would say it's sort of like, yes, you want to be collaborative, but your group at the end of this, you want to have a really solid um, pitch that you're proud of. I would like the way that you uh, encourage people to voice their um, disagreement. I think it's really good, uh, good advice because it's, disagreement or uh, playing devil's advocate can certainly sharpen the thinking around any idea. And it's a critical um, role or it's a, it's a critical function in these team environments for sure. That's great. Good. All right. Let's see what uh, question we got next. Does it matter? Okay. So we already talked about this. We, we can just say, no, it does not matter if your idea is not selected by the group. Now, that doesn't mean you should go in there with a pitch that you full ex fully expect not to be chosen or you you know, don't put a lot of time into it. Nope. That's part of the assignment is to put your time into a pitch and to come to present a pitch that you feel good about. But at the end of the day, it does not matter at all if your idea is chosen or not. People whose ideas are chosen can end up hogging the mic and being way too domineering and just get their you know, turn off the observers and lose their chance at admissions. And likewise, people that whose idea hasn't been chosen who are still able to add to the idea, to push the group along, to keep people moving, they're, even though their idea wasn't selected, they're going to be a star performer in the group. So ideally, all of you guys, everybody in your group is a star performer. Um, as, as Rachel said, it, it's very common that entire teams will be accepted. It's not a zero sum game whatsoever, um, but it doesn't matter at all if your, your pitch is, is selected but make sure even if it's not, this is important. Um, you know, sometimes let's say you have a background in marketing or finance and the idea is something pretty heavy on supply chain that you're like, Ooh, I haven't gone to business school. So I, I haven't learned about supply chain. So I have no idea what that person is talking about. That happens. Sometimes there's an idea that you're like, oh, gosh, I don't have anything to add because I haven't studied that. Well, yes, you do. You have lots to add. You're a critical thinker. You can think about those all those elements that the pitch is required to deliver on, right? The assessment, the faculty, um, the, the two main learning objectives. Even if you're just asking questions about like, okay, well, we really didn't articulate that second learning objective. Did I hear it right? Was it this? You know, you, there, there's value to be had, even if you're unclear, or like you're not a subject matter expert. Um, so if your idea is not selected, that does not mean there's not a role for you, multiple roles for you to play in that, um, in the TBD. How do I balance, um, you know, leadership being a team player? I think you guys have heard a lot on this. Um, and I, I just say, be aware. So it, I, Rachel said it towards the um, end of one of the initial questions we had where, how do you prepare? And a lot of it's about self-awareness. It's same of like being aware how you are, um, you know, kind of uh, navigating this team-based discussion. If you find yourself, you're talking a lot, make sure you're including others. Um, you know, make sure you're asking people if they haven't, if, you, if someone's been quiet, a strong leader will find a way to bring that person in to the conversation. Um, a strong leader will also recognize their answer. Their opinion isn't necessarily the best one or the only one. So, all of those are, you know, you just want to be aware of your behavior um, and also be aware of the cues that you're picking up from other people in the team-based discussion. Rachel, anything to add to that one? No, I think you pretty much covered it. Okay, good. All right, well, we'll keep going. Um, if my idea is selected, that's the whole thing. I mean, this is, I feel like this is like really that 
if my idea is not selected or is selected, that's where what makes each of the TBDs can be challenging and, and a little um, intimidating. And it is, um, you know, even if you go through a, a few of these, what happens in the real one might differ. So you need to be ready to play any role. Um, and, um, you know, you, you have to, if your idea is selected, I think Rachel did a really good job of being, you know, you want to sort of make sure you, ha you have an image, you have a vision in mind, um, of what the answer should be. And you might not get to, you might get to a different version of it, but one really good role that you can play is just help, um, advance your team towards, um, some outcome that you guys can all get behind and present to. Yeah, I would just say in that one, research, research, research. So again, we don't want you dominating the discussion and we don't want the end product to look like your idea. But in order to be able to add you know, um, comments, because keep in mind, everybody else in the group is going to have probably never even heard of what you've come up with. So they're, you know, they're going to be uh, able to do kind of creative thinking and be strategic and everything else, but they're not going to probably have the subject matter expertise. So um, I would almost say just to research, research, research so that you have some content um, kind of depending on where the, the conversation goes. What are the common roles? I think we've covered a fair amount of these. Um, timekeeper, devil's advocate, and the ones who drive it forward. Um, I think what I'll say on this one is I want to hold, there, there's other elements. I, you know, there's the sort of just the really creative thinker who can always be brainstorming on the side. There's a person who, um, summarizes at key points what they're hearing and playing back. That can be a really vital function too, because oftentimes people, this is a little bit getting to a question we have of the gaffes that we've seen is like, you know, we'll hear people be like, people are so eager to make a comment that somebody will say something. And then the, the main person's like, oh yeah, good idea. And then I was also thinking this, and it's completely unrelated to what that first person said. So they actually weren't listening at all. They just wanted to get their voice in. Um, you know, so sometimes things get a little lost in the shuffle. So playing the sort of summarizing role or, or helping make sure that everyone on the team is hearing the same thing, or even like testing out what you've heard and see how people react to it. I think that can be a pretty important role. Yeah. The other thing I would add is um, if you think about sort of um, groups that you're in at work or meetings or whatever it might be, chances are you don't play the same role for the entire meeting or for the entire time that you're in the group. And so that's, I would say the most frequent dynamic is that people change roles. So you might be um, at one point kind of like the idea maker or kind of uh, at another point, you might be somebody building on someone else's idea. You might one time comment on what the time is. So I would say often like the kind of like Liza was saying that the role of synthesizing the idea or noting what the time is, isn't necessarily just one person. Sometimes it can be one person taking notes. Um, but, but I would say as frequently or more, it's those roles kind of rotate. And so you'll find, you know, that, that within that 30 minutes, it may be that a couple of people talk more in the beginning, a couple of people talk more in the end, um, it could be based on the content could be based on whatever else. But so I would say the most important thing is back to this idea of like, you can't prepare, there is no role that you can take. It's not that you are going to show up kind of put your flag down as some specific role. And then that's what you're going to be doing for the entire group, uh, you're kind of, kind of the entire session. So it's really about being flexible, um, seeing what roles other people take. I mean, you might not be a note taker. So I'm not a natural note taker, but if that's how my group is going to get this done, I will sit there. And if nobody else is doing it, I will sit there and take notes and progress the group in that way. So at the end of the day, even if you take um, kind of a less comfortable or less familiar role, Take the role that you have to take. It's funny. Um, I'll digress for one second, but in the old um, kind of a couple of years ago, one of the key questions that they no longer ask in the one on one interview was whether you took a role, whether you took your um, a role that you normally take. And I just thought it was an interesting um you know, kind of recognition that in these team based discussions, people will take a different role than they normally take. So I don't believe, you know, we don't know exactly how it's going to play out this year. It's not a question that they have been asking in the last few years, but I would just say you don't want to become too rigid about this is the role that I play and this is the role that I must play in this group because um, you don't know. You could end up with f six people who are very similar and everybody wants to play the same role. Good. Um, ah, yes, this one has happened. 
Uh, what if you happen to follow a pitch um, that is very similar to your idea? Should you use an opportunity to be collaborative, react to the other's pitch, point out synergies with your own pitch? Y yes. Well, you should stick with your pitch. You can, you know, make sure you've heard, you can recognize that you heard it. Well, believe it or not, I have a pitch that's actually quite similar. Here's my, here's my pitch. And like, you can just acknowledge it, but it's totally fine if you have two pitches that are similar. What I wouldn't do is um, spend too much time because even if two people have the same idea and the same pitch, that doesn't actually mean that your team is going to select that either of those two ideas as the, the pitch that you guys really want to focus on through the rest of the team-based discussion. So what I wouldn't do in that pitch is really derail your selling of your idea by um, trying to focus too much on the other pitch. Just acknowledge it. Wow, this is going to sound familiar. This is kind of, um, this is bizarre that we both came up with the same idea, but I'm going to go ahead and share what mine, there's a little, there's some flavors that are different and just own it. That's fine. Uh, what gaps have you observed? So we could probably, I, so I'll, I'll share one. I'm going to try to, um, to, um, limit us both to one and who knows, maybe I'll steal Rachel's one and then she'll have to come up with another or just say, that was what I was going to say. But I would say one gaff I see, it's not really a gaff. But sometimes people, you know, often ask a question like, hey, guys, um, you know, should we do this now? Or, um, hey, guys, we haven't thought about the metrics. Um, should we think about them now? Um, and or what do you guys think about metrics? I don't know. Anything like that. What it does is, it, yes, you're asking a question, but to be even more effective, I would always encourage you to put a stake in the ground and to have an opinion to get other people to react to. If you're just throwing at, or does anybody have any ideas for metrics? It's just kind of like you're giving up all ownership. You're not actually showing any thinking. Yeah, you're advancing the conversation, but you're also really requiring that somebody else on the team step up. So you could say, uh, guys, we haven't talked about assessment. Want to get your ideas. One idea I had was, um, let's do a exam at the end that does X, Y, Z, but would love to hear reactions to that and any other ideas. So put a stake in the ground instead of just asking blanket, like blank questions that actually don't show any of your own thinking. It's just a way um, I think it's going to generate better conversation. So that would be one strategy I keep in mind. Rachel, anything from a gaffe you want to add? Yeah, not gaffe exactly, but I would say kind of along the lines of what you said, I think there can be a real rush, particularly when you're picking ideas to just sort of like pick one because people feel under time pressure. Um, and so my advice is to kind of let let the group play out and like listen to people because what will happen is somebody will say like, I like such and such idea and this idea. And then all of a sudden everybody just starts to like be so frantic to agree and so it's like, it's not so much a gaffe, but just my recommendation is really just like step back and say, okay, well, let's have everybody share their thoughts or um, basically try not to pile on, basically try not to pile onto the group think, which happens, that's the most obvious place, but there's other places as well. And so um, it's like your, your whole group will benefit from you just stepping back to say, okay, you know, that's great. Let's each think through or, you know, or each chime in with our thoughts on this rather than, you know, the first, what, what often happens is the first person who speaks to say they like such and such idea, the whole group gloms on um, and you end up kind of potentially pursuing an idea that nobody's really that much of a fan of, and it may not be the strongest idea that you have. Um, so I would just say, take your time and really be honest. Again, you might have an opinion that's different from others. You might be the only one who liked one idea that isn't selected. Fine. You make your 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 case. You make your voice heard, and then you agree with the um if the group if they go a different direction. Great. Good. Um, what's your advice in the presentation? Giving us only five minutes. Do all six participants try to take a speaking role? Or does a group collaboratively select? Select. I vote for all six if you can do it. It's just good. It, what if you have like four and then the two other people don't speak? Like, get everybody speaking. You guys can do it. You guys can figure it out. That would be my advice. Um, it's some reasons for some situations, maybe it doesn't make sense. But just remember, you want to make sure you're thinking about the full team, not just a subset of the team. Yeah, I would agree. I, I really can't think of any scenarios where there may be a reason why somebody doesn't speak, but I really can't think of any scenarios where pretty much everybody didn't speak. And I think that's probably the structure that you want to follow if you can. All right. We'll touch on this one quickly, the one-on-one, -on -one, just because if, if, if you, um, 
Now we're getting to the part that's more similar to all other interviews, where it's one-on-one, -on -one, where you're gonna be asked a few questions. The only difference with the one-on-one -on -one for Wharton is it's really brief. And again, they really added this just because they recognize that this, um, you know, this TBD is sort of unique and they wanted to give you a chance to make sure like if you um, weren't able to have um, the play the role that you wanted to or didn't you felt off or just really wanted to make sure that they were getting to know you as an applicant. I think it's great that Wharton has this little 10 minute one on one, um, typically with a second year, a member of the admissions team. It will follow your Zoom. You might have to chill out in the kind of waiting room for a while, but you'll have it afterwards. Um, and it, the, the session will be primarily focused on your goals and why Wharton. Super straightforward. Um, so definitely things that you want to prepare ahead of time. And we'll go through a few questions now. How do you prepare? Really, this is where you prepare the, 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 the basics. I say the basics, but like you should know, walk me through your resume. You should know how to articulate your goals. You should know why Wharton. And you want to be specific. And one tip I always say when they say why Wharton, flip that question, right? Um, don't hear why Wharton in your head. Instead, answer the question of what resources do I have to take advantage of at Wharton in order to reach my goals? When you answer, try to answer why Wharton, you end up describing Wharton or pandering um, and kind of complimenting Wharton, how awesome Wharton is. So to avoid that, really flip that question to focus on what do you need to take advantage of at Wharton to reach your goals? Um, you should uh, be familiar with your resume and different stories on your resume in case, as we said, more often than not, they're just going to ask about your goals and why Wharton and maybe a little bit about tell me about yourself, but be prepared for anything. There's no reason not to. You want to be um, prepared as you would be for any one-on-one -on -one interview. Um, so even though it's just 10 minutes, when you're prepping, be ready for what could, you know, it's not going to turn into a 50-minute discussion, but any of those questions that might pop up in a 50 minute interview, you wanna be prepared um, for just in case in the 10 minute version, just because that's just a better better way to go in to make sure that you can handle any question. Um, great, and then let's see any other questions on this. Um, what sort of questions should I ask them? Rachel, any tips on what should I, because you will get the opportunity for you to ask the interviewer questions. So, any guidance on what questions the interviewers should ask the, in, sorry, the interviewees should ask the interviewer? So this is sort of general guidance. This is my advice to anybody ever asking an interviewer question ever, um, which is, it's basic, but you want to ask, so the first is you want the question that you ask to be something that you are going to action. So ask, people sometimes ask random questions where the information that they're going to get, there's nothing they can do with. Um, so, that, um, so that's the first thing. Don't ask a question where the answer is on the website. Um, and the third thing is uh, ask a question where the person that you are asking the question of can answer it. So sometimes people will say, um, what do you think of XYZ club? How do you know if that person participated in the club? A much nicer way to ask the question is, are there any experiences you had that were can't miss? Were there any clubs that you were a part of or something that's like a much more expansive question that allows somebody to answer it in the way they want? Because the last thing you want is somebody to say, no, I didn't do that. <laughs> and often I find in mock interviews, people will ask a very specific question like, did you take such and such class? And it's like, it's when the person says no, you've effectively shut down the discussion. There's nowhere to go from that. Um, so it's sort of like, let them give you the information that they want. It does, you know, the questions don't have to be so, so broad, um, but definitely, um, you know, it, it, it can be nice if you show a little bit of research on Wharton, you know, so that you you know a little bit about the school and you have a sense of what you might want to participate in. Um, but I would just say, really make sure that your questions will resonate with the interviewer. I always say like, you want them not, you know, answering um, positively too. So I totally agree. You don't want to ask them a question that can be answer like, no then you don't know where to go. But likewise, you're not, you're, you're not, you're still not the, the, um, sh uh, the shopper, you're still the seller. So what I mean by that is you know, nor do you want to be like, so what percent of people actually were successful in their, um, in starting up their company? I don't know. And then someone is actually has to like share something that's not positive, then just the entire vibe of the conversation goes way down. You're not trying to test them. You're not trying to. So 
like what Rachel said, make sure it's a question that they can kind of answer and answer positively is my take on that. So any behavioral questions in the one-on-one? -on -one? So should you expect them? No. Should you be ready? Yes, absolutely. It, it, it's fair game. Tell me about the leadership experience you're most proud of. Tell me about a time when you failed. There's nothing to say that they cannot ask those questions. They most likely will not, but you should be ready no matter what. There's no reason not to. You've got time and you should prep for those. How many questions is it standard in general? Is it standard um, to ask? Like I personally would say have four or five prepare, prepared. You'll be able to get a read from the interviewer how much time you have. But four to five feels like a reasonable amount where you can have a, a robust conversation with that person. Um, all right. These are all great question, questions, guys. Um, I, I'm blaming it on the tech issue at the beginning that we've, we've taken right up to the top of the hour. But I'm going to go quickly through these last two slides. Thank you guys all for chiming in for this. So just uh, essential steps. Practice your pitch. Practice it. Limit it to one minute. Use um, your phone to make sure you're not going over. Make it vivid and specific and something that ideally you're excited about and know something about. Have a team mindset. Everybody in your team, it, it, this is your business school team for this interview. Make sure you all win. Have that like, it's not a winner takes all. It's everybody can win. Simulate the experience. It's essential. It is kind of like this unknown. And chances are, once you go through it, you'll be like, oh, that was really fun. I see what all the hype's about. Research Wharton and really an easy tip, tip reread your Wharton essays. You've answered a lot of this stuff already. So reread your essays before your TBD and develop your questions ahead of time. You're going to be exhausted after the TBD. You're going to be like, oh my gosh, how did that go? Blah, blah, blah. Get the questions out of the way, have them um, in your, like prepare them ahead of time so that you're not kind of stuck uh, a deer in headlights when they ask any questions for me, which they will. Okay, and then finally, so just additional resources from Gatehouse, and actually I think there are quite a few Gatehouse uh, clients that um, have chimed in or uh, have uh, signed up for this, which is awesome. Um, but for those of you who are not, um, if you've been invited to interview, definitely encourage you to take advantage of our Wharton Mock interview services. We're really excited. We've always done these sort of internally, and this is the first year that we're giving um, folks that aren't already working with us a chance to practice with us. Um, you have the full simulated TBD experience. Um, but in addition to what one thing that we're able to do because of the team that Gatehouse has with Wharton alumni on the team, such as Rachel, is a one on one with a Wharton alumna, um, alumna or alumnus. Um, and in that session, not only would it be a mock interview, a mini mock interview, but also some time to get direct feedback and practice on your pitch as well. Um, they're starting to fill up quickly, though, so reach out, especially if you have an early interview date so that we can get you into one of our early slots. Um, and then beyond that, if you are kind of really um, early on in the process and still just thinking about business school and just attended this to see what the Wharton interview might be like if you apply, um, definitely reach out to us for a free consultation. And uh, we have services where we can partner with you at every step of the way, not just the interview, although we do get very excited about um, during interview season. So that's a wrap, guys. Thank you all for chiming in. Hopefully this was helpful. I want to give a shout out to Rachel. Thank you so much, Rachel. We are just mm -hmm. super lucky at Gatehouse to have you on the team and have you as sort of this expert on Wharton, but not just Wharton, just a an excellent peer to have on the team. So thank you and thank everybody. And I think that's a, that's a wrap. Thanks, Liza. Thanks. Bye, guys.